scripture reading will read from Lamentations 3, 19 through 24. Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath and still in remembrance and assembled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because of compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will therefore will I hope in him. If you're a Christian here today, you have that hope to be with Jesus Christ one day in heaven. And that's that's one of the best things that, that you could hope for. And I I hope that if you're not a Christian that you'll you you'll someday find that you have no idea what you're missing out on because it, it will change your life for the good. So brother uh, David. Thank you, Brother Mark. Go ahead and turn to 645, if you would, in this song book. That'll be our invitation song today at that time. If there's anybody here that's, that's not a Christian, uh, if you've heard the word and, and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, then uh, you need to repent. You need to believe that he is, and then you need to repent. Uh, you need to repent and ask for forgiveness of your sins, and that's something you can do right where you are. Talk to the Lord about it. Tell him you want to get your life turned around and want to start living your life for him. Uh, we hear the word, we believe, we repent, we also have to confess him before men. So during that closing song, if you would like to come forward and give your life to Christ, we give you that opportunity to confess Christ before men. And also he says we need to be baptized for remission of sins. And we would make that available to you at this time also. Um, so that closing song is, is very important. Also, during that closing song, um, if uh, if you were a Christian but you turned away from the Lord and, and you'd like to come back to Him and start living for Him once again, you can do as, uh, as Simon the Sorcerer was told to do, repent and pray. Uh, you need to repent still and you need to pray that the Lord would, would come back into your life and that you'd start being a part of His life once again. And repentance is what's necessary at that point. We would ask you, if you would, to come forward and share that with us, that you're starting to live for the Lord again. Uh, let us share in your joy. Uh, if not, you know, you don't. it's not required that you, you come forward and share that with us. Also, if you are a Christian and uh, you're not a member here at Lacey Creek, we'd encourage you to come forward at that time if you'd like to take membership here at Lacey Creek. Uh, those that have been baptized into Christ here at Lacey Creek are our members. And uh, anyone else, if, if you've done what you need to do and you've been baptized for remission of sins, if it was at another congregation or something and you'd like to take a membership here, we'd encourage you to uh, come forward and let us know so that we can add you to our roles here at Lacey Creek. Um, Brother Mark was, was talking about hope. And certainly that's something that we all share as Christians, we share that hope for eternal life. And uh, we all want to be in the same place after this life is over. We all want to go to heaven and be with the Lord for all eternity. That's why we need to work together to that end. We need to work together. We don't need to, to, to fight amongst ourselves or anything like that. We need to work together. We need to study the Bible together. We're told to assemble to encourage one another, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That means to encourage, to lift other people up. Today I want to I want to go to James chapter three. The Lord kept pulling me back to this chapter. I was looking at it and then others and came back to this one and I kept coming back to it. It says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now the word, the, the Greek word that's translated as masters here in Hebrews chapter 5, 12, 
It's the same word as there in the Hebrew, but it's translated. It says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again. Masters and teachers. Both of them translated from the same Greek word. So we're talking about teachers. Not to be a whole lot of teachers because they receive a greater condemnation. I, I wasn't all that interested in being a teacher, to be honest with you. But as the Lord kept bringing me back to James 3, he was a whole lot harder on me. Of course, I guess I probably fought it more. But I've given my life to Christ, and, and I want to do what he wants me to do. And this is where he's put me, and this is where he's placed me. And I take that as an awesome responsibility. And I don't ever want to be slack in it. So I study as much as I can, and, and I try to get the truth out as best I can. But I'm a man. And I make mistakes. And, you know, I, I pray that, that you guys pray for me and pray for the others when they come up here that we might stay in the Word. That we might have the understanding, that we might be able to share the godly wisdom that comes out of this book. So that we might all increase that hope of spending eternity together in heaven. If I make a mistake, if I misread something... If maybe I'm even off in the doctrine some and, and somebody needs to correct me, please do so. I don't want to keep getting it wrong. For one thing, I don't want to go to heaven, but I certainly don't want other, a lot of other people following me into hell. It's important that we teach the word right. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Um, in Proverbs 18, verse 13, this, this is a place I know I have some problems myself, and I think, uh, I think Linda will verify it. It says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. And, and I do. And I, others may have this same problem, but sometimes we... We think we know what somebody's going to ask before we allow them to ask the question. And we start answering it before the question's even asked. And it may not even be what the question was. I see some smiling back there. Apparently it's not just me. We need to hear the question. We need to listen. We have two ears and only one mouth. We need to use the ears to listen to start with. We need to put our brain in gear before we put our mouth in motion. Sometimes I'm guilty of that. Um, also in, in Proverbs 18, just a few verses down from there in verse 19, we see that sometimes when we do this kind of thing, we might cause more problems than, than we realize. In verse 19 of, of Proverbs 18, it says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like bars of the castle. We do something like that, and we offend somebody one time, even a Christian brother or sister. It could be hard to get them back into the fold or, or back into to listening and, and hearing what the Bible says. We may cause somebody to, to start not coming to church, to gradually quit coming, and pretty soon they're not coming at all, and pretty soon they're back into the ways of the world. It can cause great offense. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven for driven of force, fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm whithersoever the governor listed. Here's two small objects, a bit, that goes in a horse's mouth. And I, I'm not much into horses. I really don't like them much. They don't like me much. I'll pat them on the head, but that's about as far as it goes. But I know there's, there's you can cause them to slow down or, or, or pick up speed or, or turn or whatever by the reins. And when you do that, it's through the bit in their mouth that causes them to turn when you tell them what they need to do. Just a small thing. But look how much bigger a horse is than we are. 
But we can control that horse just because of that tiny little bit that goes in its mouth. The same with the rudder of a ship. You know, depending on how big the ship is, in comparison, the rudder is tiny. It's just a small little thing on the back of the ship, and it turns one way and makes the ship go one way, and you turn it the other way and it goes the other direction. Plain and simple. But it's real tiny. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire can do. You know, I've, I've been seeing forest fires talked about on the, on the news. I, I can't even imagine hundreds of miles, hundreds of square miles that have been burned because somebody threw a match at it, because somebody threw a lit cigarette in the wrong place. In their trash can at home, that the trash can got set outside, and then it caught the trees on fire, and that tree burnt down forests. Burnt down homes, plural, tens of hundreds of, or tens of, tens of homes. I don't know, 30, 80? I don't remember. I remember the numbers that I was, was hearing about those was tremendous. All from one little tiny spark or match. It says, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts of great things. We need to control our tongue. Again, we need to put our brain in gear before we put our mouth in motion. Proverbs 26, beginning with verse 20. It says, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceases. As coals are to burning coals, and wood to fire, so is the contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. The tongue is a fire, the next verse tells us in, in James 3. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serp serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. Back in Genesis chapter 1, Beginning with verse 27, we're told, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. You know, I see these programs on TV about these big creatures that seem to dominate everything. All the other animals in the forest or in the woods or in the jungle or in the, or in the water are afraid of it because it's so great and mighty. And their biggest enemy is usually man. Man is the one that can control. Man is the one that, that is able to tame the lion. We've seen lion tamers in the, in the circus. Man is the one who can take on a shark. Not barehanded, but we have intelligence. And we have ways of going after this shark and ways of taking care of it. Man can do all these things, but verse 8 says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. It says no, no man can tame it. Sometimes we get kind of carried away with what we're saying and we may say things we shouldn't. But James chapter 1 verse 26 tells us, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. We can put a bridle on our tongue. We can control our own tongue. I remember not... This is not something I'm proud of, but I'll share it with you because it makes a point. I was in the military 
before I gave my life to Christ, before I was a Christian, I talked like somebody that they would refer to as a sailor. I'll tell you one thing. When I was around my mom and dad, not a word. It didn't come out. You can control your tongue. I think that's consistent with most people. If, if, you, if you learn these kind of words and stuff and start using them, when you get around your parents, you're not going to use them. I'm giving my life to Christ. I don't, don't talk like that around anybody. I'm the one that they don't talk around like that now. The tongue can no man tame, but, but we are able to control our own tongue. And again, a lot of times that just that just takes some time to stop and think about what it is you're saying. <coughs> therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. You know, if we're talking bad about somebody, we're talking bad about God. If you do it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. 1 John 4, 20 and 21, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. We need to love one another. We need to encourage one another. When we assemble together, it should be to lift each other up. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Jesus says we can't serve two masters. You know, our mouth, our tongue can't be speaking two different things either. Either you love the one and hate the other, or vice versa. Does a fountain send forth the same? Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? A fountain that's got sweet water is going to have sweet water. A fountain that has bitter water or salt water, or salty water, it's going to be salty, and it's going to be bitter. You can't take a handful of water out of a pond and drink it and it'd be real good and take another handful out of the same one and have salt water. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brother, bear olive berries? Either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water fresh. It's going to be one or the other. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? James asks a question here and then he goes on and answers it in the last part of this verse. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. This is how we can be a wise man or a wise person, individual, with the knowledge of Christ with the knowledge, with the wisdom that comes from knowing Christ. James 1, chapter 5, or James chapter 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If we lack wisdom, we go to God. We ask God for that wisdom. But now we can't just sit idly by all the time and say, God, give me wisdom. We need to study his word so that we know what heavenly wisdom is. We need to have the knowledge of God and know something about the mind of God, which is what the Bible is. We need to have some knowledge of that in order to receive that wisdom. If we don't know anything about the Bible and somebody asks us, well, it was on uh, In Search of the Lord's Way today. He said there was a, a survey done not too long ago across the United States. They asked people, you know, if they were knowledgeable of the Bible. 79% said, yes, we are. That same group of people, 45%, is all that knew 
The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 45% is all that knew Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the four Gospels. But 79% thought they were knowledgeable of the Bible. We need to know what the Bible says. You know, people wear these bracelets. What would Jesus do? WWJD. We don't know what Jesus would do if we don't get in the Bible and study it. We all have that hope for heaven. We all want to spend eternity there. We need to work together to get there. That's why we need to go together and work and study God's Word. To know what the Bible says. Not just to listen to somebody up here, but to check it out in the Word and make sure what's said is according to God's Word. I'm thankful I go here. I think that's something that, that this congregation does tremendously. I have guys come to me once in a while and say, hey, did you say what I thought you said? And we'll look at it, and maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Sometimes I do, and sometimes it wasn't me. And sometimes we need to sit down and look over a while. And I've done those things with members of this congregation. And I know there's people in here that are very bible read. That's how I got into it myself. That's why I had the desire to learn more about what the Scripture said, because people in here did. And I saw it. Verse 14 says, But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. Galatians 5, verse 15 says, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. <coughs> Again, we need to be together on things, not contrary to each other. The verse right above that, the last part of verse 14 says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's, that's the law of Christ. If we go up to verse 9, it says a little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. It doesn't take a lot bitter resentment and things like that for it to build and to grow greater and stronger. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly, sensual and devilish. The wisdom to, to bicker and, and fight and have bitter envy and strife in our hearts is earthly. Verse 16 says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Those are the kind of things we want to avoid as Christians. Verse 17 says, But the wisdom that is from above. This is the wisdom we want to look at. When we ask God for an increase in wisdom, this is what we're talking about. We want to be able to answer questions. We want to be able to know what to do in a given situation. We want to know how to handle certain things. And we ask God for wisdom. We can do it for a specific situation. Or we can do it in general, that we would continue to grow and, and be more knowledgeable of God's Word. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. It's free from any kind of lies or hypocrisy. It's true. It is pure. Then, peaceable. In Romans 12, 18, we're told, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know, living peaceably with, with Christian brothers and sisters should be simple. Living peaceably with all men, with people of the world, that's where it gets a little more difficult. And some people, that's why it says, If it be possible, there's some people that don't want to. There's some people that wouldn't want to have anything to do with somebody that's a Christian or calls themselves a Christian. They won't get along with them no matter what you do. But if it be possible, we should live peaceably with all men. It says gentle. We need to be easy or fair in our, in our temper, temperament when talking to somebody else. Easy to be entreated. Now that comes from a a uh, Greek word that, that means yielding to heavenly wisdom. Easy to be entreated. 
We need to go along with what the Bible says, with what God's Word says. That's where the wisdom is. If we ask for an increase in wisdom, it's, a, it's asking for a better understanding of God's Word. We need to be full of mercy, it says. You know, we're told with, with the kind of mercy that we give other people, that's how we're going to be judged. We're going to receive the same kind of mercy that we give to other people. You know, if somebody asks us for forgiveness for something, we say, we can't do that. We can't forgive them. We can't show them any mercy. What kind of mercy is God going to show for us? How many times a day does God forgive me for something I've done or said or thought? How come I can't find the same kind of forgiveness in my heart? If I'm supposed to be like the Lord, I need to be forgiving. It also full of good good fruits. Good fruits is is used as good deeds. We're told we need to do good to all men, especially to those that are of the household of faith. Good deeds according to godly wisdom. We're told it needs to be without partiality. God is no respecter of persons, and we need to be no respecter of persons. And without hypocrisy, which means not a pretend friendliness, but a sincere friendliness. First Peter 1, 22. First Peter 1, 22 says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that ye love one another with a pure heart, perfectly. In uh, Matthew 5, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. This time we're going to sing our song of invitation again if you're not a Christian. If you've heard the word and you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you've repented, we ask you to come forward. We might give you that opportunity to confess Christ before man and be baptized for remission of sins. If you've if you turned away from the Lord and you want to give your life, life back to Him, pray. Repent. Ask God for forgiveness that you might start living for Him again. And, and again, I'll mention, if, if, if you are a Christian but you don't have a place that you call home, this, this doesn't have anything to do with your salvation other than it gives you a place to work and to work with other people. We ask you if you'd like to take membership here to come forward and we'll add you to the to the to the book here at Lacey Creek. It's important to be a member of a family. It's more important to be in the Lamb's Book of Life. But we need to work together. Number